so we, we are we are very pleased to have uh, C. Aishwarya from CMI. So Aishwarya is uh, Aishwarya did her PhD from uh, IMSE and currently she is a professor of computer science in uh, Chennai Mathematical Institute and she has braved uh, very bad traffic to <laughs> reach here more or less her time. So thanks a lot and over to Aishwarya. <laughs> Thank you for the opportunity. It's a great uh, pleasure and honor to be here and to talk to you. I'm sorry for the delay. Um, I'm sorry for the ad hoc um, arrangement. Um, so let us start. So, so please feel free to interrupt me at any point. You know, just raise your hands and ask questions or whatever. Okay. So. You all know polynomials. We start from polynomials, okay? So what's a polynomial? For example, you have something like no, not that this. this is a polynomial, right? So so on a single variable x, okay, so so there is a x square term, the coefficient of that term is one, x cube term coefficient is two. So this thing, this is these are polynomials, and then there are series. You know about this power series, right? So essentially, this extension of polynomials. So polynomials have only a finite number of terms. You have an infinite number of terms. So every term is of a different degree. So for example, one series that I will write here. Okay. So every term is present, the coefficient of every term is 1 in this series, okay. Another series, what is the coefficient of x power i here, 3, i plus 3, okay. So and another series. So what is the coefficient of x power i here? So coefficient of x power i is 21. So it's going in the Fibonacci series, like 0, 1, 1, um, 2, 3, 5, etc. So okay, essentially there are these series and these series you can also think of them as some function from natural numbers to let us say integers essentially what I was asking you what is the coefficient of the ith term. So the i is the i is the input to this function and that for every i it will tell you what is the coefficient of the term with x power i okay. So for every series you can as well denote it with some f sigma right for the series sigma the f sigma is the function which will take a natural number and give you some integer. So of course these examples that I wrote here they were all taking coefficients from natural numbers. It can be integers, it can be reals, it can be any number, complex numbers, whatever you want, okay. So yeah, just think of it like this. So such functions from natural numbers to integers are equivalent to series. They are the same thing. So in this talk, in this one hour what we will see is we will see some way of representing such series or such functions by graphs. How many of you are familiar with the graphs? All of you know what graphs are, okay. So what we will draw is we will draw a finite graph, okay. So for example, So there can be loops, this is a directed graph and they need not be simple. So between the same pair of vertices there may be multiple edges, okay. So there are these graphs and some of these vertices, so 
the graph have verti has vertices and edges right some of these ed vertices i will mark it with some initial mark okay so the, the, these are called source vertices source or initial vertices and some of them will have this dangling outgoing edge okay so these are the final or target or sink okay so these are essentially graphs and a subset of these vertices i will mark them as initial a subset of these vertices i will mark them as final and they are non simple so there may be multiple edges between the same pair of vertices but it's a finite graph there are only finitely many vertices okay okay so i have a such a graph then what is the function denoted by such a graph so these graphs in computer science we call them automata but it's basically this object so what is the function associated with such a graph the function that we associate is so given some integer n this will be mapped to the number of distinct paths that you have from initial to final of length n so this paths need not be simple it can visit the same edges several times same nodes several times that is not a problem the length of that path or the length of that walk whatever you call it that must be n okay so that is what we want so this maps to number of paths of length n initial to final so it can start from any initial it can end in any final this is all fine we just want some path from initial to final okay so this is the function represented by such a graph so the questions in computer science we ask is like what kind of functions can you represent using such graphs what kind of functions can you not represent using such graphs or given some function can you design is like designing an algorithm or designing a program can you design a graph to exactly represent this function okay this is what happens in theoretical computer science um, kind of questions that we will look at some of the questions that we will look at so in this particular example just try to we will just evaluate we will try the find the value of this function on some points okay given by this particular graph on zero of length zero how many paths can you find from initial to final <coughs> so initial means it has to start here and it has to end either here or here is there a path of zero length from initial to final no so the number of such paths is zero okay, so this will be mapped to zero one will get mapped to again zero two will get mapped to two is okay so this is one path of length two this is another path of length two both going from initial to final of course there is no path of length 2 which reaches that final okay so 2 will get mapped to 2 3 will get mapped to Let's look at all the paths that end here. How many paths can you find of length four? So there is only one initial from the initial. So here is one of length three. One, two, three. Length three. Okay. There is another one. Length three. Can you find another path of length three starting from here and ending here? Okay. So there are two paths of length three ending here. how many paths will end there two so this is one path and this is another path okay so this will so the total number of paths is 2 plus 2 4 and so on so so this is the 
meaning of such a graph, so the function represented by such a graph. For every integer n, you just find the number of n length paths that you can get in this graph from some initial node to some final step. So just add them all up, that is the number. So it's a function from natural numbers to natural numbers in this particular case, because I'm just counting the number of paths. Okay, so this function, uh, this graph, it represents the series 2x square plus 4x cube plus something. Okay, I, we did not divide. So on the zero term, the constant term was zero here because zero would map to zero. X term coefficient of x was zero to zero. So the first term which is non-zero is x square and so on. Okay. So this is how we um, define so-called automata or graphs and the the functions that they represent. So now let us design, now we will do the other way around. We are not given a graph, but we have given just functions and we want to come up with graphs. We want to design graphs which will have, which will realize this function, okay. So this is our next exercise. So consider the function which maps, okay, it's a constant function one. On every, everywhere the value is exactly one. So for every length, there is exactly one path from initial to final. Can you give such a graph? Hmm? Yeah, can you tell again? Star? What is the star graph? So the initial and the final is the same. So on length zero, it has of length zero, it has exactly one path. Okay, that path path has length zero. It's not taking any edge, but it's starting in an initial node and ending in a final node. That node itself. On length one or any length, what you can do is you can just take this loop as many number of times, and there is a path. So it's it's a very simple graph with only one vertex, and that represents this particular constant function. Now suppose that I want a F1. I want n maps to n. Like that. Complete graph on how many vertices? So we need a finite number of vertices and this is for every n. So in particular on length 0 there should be, should not be any path because 0 should map to 0, 1 should map to 1, 2 should map to 2 and so on. So how many vertices will you have? I will draw the graph as you say. So what is that number? What is the finite number? So see this is for all n in natural numbers. So, so it's, it's not like you know, there is one graph that will do it for all n. Okay, It is not like for every n you draw a different graph. Okay, 2 vertices 1. 1 is initial, 1 is final. I will just make it like that. Because at least on 0 there is no, for 0 we will get mapped to 0. I will put a path here like this. It will make sure that on 1 it will get mapped to 1. Now I should, I, I want 2 to map to 2 also. Self loop where? On the final state. So how many paths does it have of length 2? 
only one path right on the very first you take this and this this is the only path so two will get mapped to one but this is not what we want i want two to map to two actually how many uh, how many paths are there of length 3 here from initial to final that is also one okay so you take this one once and this one twice so that's a path of length 3 from initial to final so 3 is also getting mapped to one so this is almost that constant function except that on zero it is zero everywhere else it is one okay so this what this graph represents is that function so almost the constant function one except for the point zero zero it's going to zero so what if i put a loop here as well i put a loop on both sides so now how many paths of length one i have exactly one path because i need to traverse that edge only then i'll go from initial to final of length two how many paths do i have okay one path is this the other path is this there are two paths of length 2 of length 3 how many do i have like 1 2 3 this is one path or 1 2 3 1 2 3 and 3 like the that this middle edge this is the edge that you must take to go from initial to final that you could have taken as the first edge or the second edge or the third edge okay for in general for an arbitrary n you can take that this interesting edge this edge you can take it at the first thing or second thing or the third one or the fourth one or the nth one so in fact so each of them will give you a different path so in in fact so there are n choices to take that thing so the number of different paths that you will have will be n so this particular graph will represent that function n goes to n okay so instead of n goes to n i want n goes to n plus 3 so on zero i should have 3 can you give a graph which realize this so can i get a for the constant 3 so every number i should get exactly three paths can you give a so okay let me write that function here so for constant 1 we knew this was the this was the graph for constant 1 for constant 3 can i get a graph how many vertices do you have okay so there are like two options that i heard let's just analyze them so one option is this so i just have one vertex and then i will put three loops like this so on a number n what does this map to so on zero it's one on one what is the map how many paths do i have of length one three paths i could have taken this or this or this on length two how many paths can i like take of length two not 3c2 it's 3 times 3 because the first edge i could have taken any of these three there are three choices for the very first edge 
For the second edge, again I have three choices. So, so all those three times three combinations will give me a different path. So taking this thing and this thing is a is one choice. This thing and this thing is another choice. This and this is another choice. So the first time I could have taken any of the three. The second one also I could have taken any of the three. So it's like three to the uh, three square. So in general for n it will give me three to the n, three power n. That is what this graph is computing. So this graph is not correct. Okay, for this constant three. But this graph is representing another function which is three to the n. Okay. 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 Now let's look at n goes to three, the constant three. The other option that I heard was put three vertices, make them all initial and final, and put a self loop on all of them. Okay. So on zero, it will map to three. So you could have taken this initial to final path, or this, or this. So each of them, if you remember, it's remembering the constant function one. And for every number, you had a choice. You could have taken it on the topmost or the middle or the lowermost. Okay, so there are three paths from initial to final on any n. Notice that this is a disconnected graph. We don't require the graph to be connected. That's not a requirement. We can have a disconnected graph, no problem at all. This will give me n goes to 3. Now what I want here is actually n goes to n plus 3. This was our original question. We know how to do n goes to n. We know how goes how to get n goes to n, uh, n goes to 3. How can I get n goes to n plus 3? How do I merge? What is the... Can, can you explain what you mean by this merge? Just putting them all side side to side. I mean, just so for this particular thing, you will have this part. This will count n. Okay, from that initial to that initial, we will have exactly. N. We will add then these three. These three extra things that will count the plus three. So from any initial to any initial, we will have exactly n plus 3. So n things that come from this connected part, one from here, one from here, and one from there. Okay. So the graph is not connected, but it will count n plus 3. Now let's look at that example. What is our next example? Okay, so this is in fact this example. This is actually n plus three. The series that we wrote. The second, uh, the term with power two was getting mapped to five, right? X power i was mapped to i power i plus one. Coefficient was i plus three. Now let us look at this Fibonacci. So, yeah. So, f of 0 is 0, f of 1 is 1, and in general, f of n is f of n minus 1 plus f of n minus 2. So, can you give a graph to realize this function?
So there is a way to construct this again guided by this inductive definition, this recurrence definition, whatever you call it. Okay. So the idea is that so on zero it should go to zero. So I have some initial state or not somewhere and a final node somewhere else. It's not the same because I don't want it to go to one or any other number. So there are zero paths between them on zero of length zero. And of length one there should be exactly one. So I just connect it like this. For length two or greater, what I want is I want X. So roughly the idea when I draw something like this is that from this vertex the number of paths going to final state on is correct. Okay, is there X at F by induction? I am trying to assume that it, it is correct. So roughly from this state the number of paths going to any of the final state is exactly the F of length n will be F of n. That is suppose you, you know this, suppose somebody tells you this. Then we know that Fn is Fn minus 1 plus Fn minus 2. Okay? So if you if you wanted to start a path of length n, you take off one edge from it. So now the remaining length is n minus 1. So with length n minus 1, you want to follow the path starting from this node with one less length. Okay? And with two less lengths again, you want to start from here. So you have you, we need to give some provision to remove one edge or two edges and both of them you should add. Okay. So if I just put this, if I just add this, how many paths are there of length n? It is actually from this node to that node, number of paths of length n will be for a big enough n, it will be the number of paths of length n minus 1 from this node to that node. It might have been a big complicated graph, okay, I don't know. So the thing is that I have taken away one edge here, the very first edge I could have taken here and the rest of the path, the n minus length path, I can take from this edge to the, this node to that node, okay. So just putting this single self loop, it is of length 1, this loop is of length 1, it is just taking one edge away. You do that one edge and after that you land in a point from where, from where you have to traverse n minus 1 edges and this n minus 1 edges suppose by some magic by induction if you have shown that the number of paths from this node to final nodes is f of n minus 1 then if your function was if your function was just this it would it would do it actually it, suppose your function was just this if this part was not there so it's actually the constant function one, except for the point zero. And in fact, if you look at it, this is exactly realizing that. Okay, f of zero is zero, f of one is one, f of n for a big enough n is f of n minus one. So f of two is actually f of one, f of three is also f of two, which is equal to f of one, which is equal to one, and so on. So it will do that. It will. It will just just realizing this this recurrence. Now I have one more term here. So it is not just that I have to take off one edge and evaluate the function at with the remaining n minus 1 edges starting from here. I could have, I should have also been able to take two edges off and then the remaining n minus 2 edges I should find a path from this node to that. So if you have to take two edges away, I cannot put a single self loop because single self loop will take only one edge away. So what I will do is I will just put like this, I just add a state in between then make it like this, state or vertex, the same thing. So this at a point n, what it will do is, you can take this path, okay, and by induction, the number of paths from this point to the, to the last without using any of these things is n minus, f of n minus 1. So, okay, we may use it, but the number of paths of length n, uh, n minus 1 from, from this node to the final nodes. Plus, it could have taken this thing, but while taking this thing, you would have you have already eaten up two edges. They have n minus two remaining edges to traverse, okay, and that is kind of realizing this function. So, this is a graph that will realize the Fibonacci number. Number of so we can also sit and verify here. So any n will map to the nth 
or f of n, well, this is a Fibonacci in a series, okay, the nth Fibonacci number, or n plus one nth Fibonacci number. I don't know whether the first one is a zero or the first, depending on that. So we will not go into the details, but it turns out that using such graphs, you can represent any so-called linear recurrences or systems of linear equation. Maybe your fn is some g of n minus 1 plus f of n minus 2. And then g of n is some f of n minus 1 plus g of n minus 2, 1. Okay, and so on. So there are several such functions. For each of those functions, you, for the base cases, you know how to do it. And then you just connect it like that. So if it was f of n minus 1, 2 plus g of n minus 1, you go to the state for g by putting only one edge between them. And to f, you will go by removing two edges because it is f of n minus 2. So how many things you have to remove? That many edges you traverse along that path and then you land there. And then the remaining thing that will take care of. So just for the base cases you will do and then by this inductive definition you can draw the graph. Okay? We will not do many examples there but this is also possible. So essentially the system of linear um, recurrences with a constant look back, so this n minus 1, n minus 2, so here is only minus 1, n minus 2, okay, up to some minus k for a fixed k we can do. Okay, so these graphs are called, in general they are called weighted automata. Okay, and in the example we saw that I can draw things like this, right? There are multiple edges. Okay, generally instead of putting the multiple edges, I can equivalently write it as single edge and I can write a weight 2 there. Just means that there were two edges between them. So, I can just put the weight 2 here. So, for example, if I had the number of paths from initial to the final on weight 2 uh, of length 2 would be 2 times 3. There were 2 edges in this side, there were 3 edges there, so you just take the product. That many different paths you can have it. You could have taken any of the 2 edges here, any of the 3 things there, so the total number of things is 2 times 3. Okay, so this is when the um, the weights that I write, they are all numbers and when I am really counting, it is exactly what I do. That's And this kind of weighted automata, these are all also called multiplicity automata exactly because of that. Because it is counting the multiplicity of the number of paths of that length, how many different paths that you can, you can have. But now that I have defined it as taking the product of the weights along the path, this is the weight of that path or that number. So let me make it a bit more interesting by adding something more here. So how many paths do I have of length 2? So what will 2 map to in this graph? the length of the path must be 2, okay. So there is one path which goes like this, but this path in, in turn it represents actually 6 paths or it is actually 2 times 3. So we just say that the weight of that path is 6, okay. There is one path whose weight is 6. There is another path which goes like this and then takes this, okay. Weight of that path is 3, okay. And the weight of this thing would be 6 plus 3 sum of the weights of different paths. This is how you, so when, so the next step as I am telling here is in this weighted automata, you have this graphs as before, but I will just put a weight on every edge. I am looking at the paths of some particular length then, every path will have a weight, which is the product of the weights along that path, okay. And there may be multiple paths, then I will just sum them, okay. That is what I would do. So of length 3, how many paths will be there? So there is one 
path which does this the weight of that would be 12 2 times 2 times 3 ok there is another path which does this the weight of that thing would be 18 there is another path which does this and this thing twice weight of that would be 9 that will be the weight of 3 that is the value that this graph gives for number 3 ok so this is in general weighted automata are exactly graphs which look like this in fact why restrict ourselves to putting weights only on the edges you can even put some weight if you want here like this can be 3 this can be 5 for example so even for 0 the weight would be now uh, this 3 times I mean if it was in the same thing it was 3 times and you start with it so every path you initially you multiply with this 3 and in the end you also multiply with a 5 so it is as good as this entire sum gets multiplied by a 3 and a 5 3 on the left and 5 on the right ok I say about left and right in case of natural numbers and reals of course multiplication is commutative so we can multiply anywhere but generally in weighted automata the multiplication need not be commutative so <laughs> this is all defined for even non commutative uh, rings semi rings so you can think of it like that and the weights why should they be natural numbers you can put some integers some negative weight now we do not see why exactly so previously I could say that you know it is like it is subtracting that there were two edges a negative weight does not make much sense as such but you can still multiply some and then define something right I mean it can give a value so previously when we were looking at a number of paths the range was always in the natural numbers you could never give a negative weight to something and now I can also define functions whose values can be negative right and why should it be um, natural numbers or why should it be even rationals I can put reals I can put this can be pi for example whatever ok so what real, real numbers I can put probabilities I can put maybe probability it has it has even meaning so there is something called probabilistic automata that is also a very well studied topic so it is kind of saying that what is the probability of success uh, so if you are right so maybe I was saying that you could take this thing with probability half this one with probability half and here you could stay here with probability 3 4 and you could take this with probability 1 4 something like this so from every edge on the outgoing for every node on the outgoing edges I give a probability distribution and with that probability you could randomly not randomly you could with that probability you could go to any of these things and then your question is I am going to take a path of length 25 what is the probability that I end up in a final edge so it is exactly the value that this graph gives is a function right so it's a function from natural numbers to 0 1 interval okay so the probability space so it could you could define probabilities you could define many other things with this kind of objects at the moment we are we are looking at so I may put the negative weight here the initial weights also may be negative or whatever so in general weights from edges slash initial mark slash final mark mark I mean this indication this is what I mean by mark from these things I will give a I, I, I can label them with some integer weight for the moment so we will just restrict ourselves to these kind of things so it can be minus 3 for example this is perfectly fine So these are in general called weighted automata or multiplicity automata. So you just for every n you just look at paths of length n multiply the weights that you see along that path of course the, with the initial mark and the final mark and if you have multiple such paths you just add the weights that you have ok. This is the weight that you will associate to an or the value that you associate to a number n in the weighted automata. So there are a whole lot of um, uh, functions that you can represent like this. In fact, any polynomial you can represent like this. Polynomial. What do we mean? 
It's okay. Not the series, polynomial series, but function like this. For example, f maps to n goes to n cube. Okay. So this actually represents the series x plus what is 2 cube? 8 x square plus 3 cube x cube plus so on. Okay. So the coefficient of x power i is actually i cube. So this function also you can represent. Okay, before going there. So we, we saw that we can represent n. Let us just do one more ex example. n square. Can you represent n square? Can you give a graph for n square? So n, I mean, yeah. So n cube is this series. So I was. So I mean, I want to go do that, but before that, I want to do n square. Okay. Then I want to go to n cube. First, we will do n square, and then later n cube. N we already know how to do. Okay. N maps to n was just this. Just a straight line. That will do more. So the moment you have like a thing like this. For some men you are counting 2 power n. So it is like some 2 power m then plus some 2 power m prime such that m plus m prime equals n minus 1. This is what you will do. Summation over all assertion m prime. This is not, uh, this will count more. Weights are always constants though. What is n? Give me the number. So I can write 7 if you like, but that won't work for everything, right? So I will write something here which is not correct, but just tell me what that one is doing. What does this map to n number n? So parts of length n, what would be the number given? So for example, length 3. How many parts are there from initial to final of length 3? Three parts, right? 1, 2, 3, or 1, 2, 3, or 1, 2, 3 of 4, of length 4, okay. so 0, this is 0, 1, it is 0, 2, it is 1, 3, it is 3. Binomial is a good intuition number of terms I do not know what exactly it is. How many terms do you have in the binomial expansion? So on 4, what is the? Permutations and combinations, that is where you, where you are. 
So we have to find a path of length 4 and if it needs to go from initial to final, I need to take this edge and this edge. So some of those two edges of these four edges somewhere, two of those edges must be this and this. So just pick which two are there. So it's actually four choose two. So it could have been the first two in which case your path will look like this. It could have been the first and the last in, case, in which case your path would look like this. Okay, or it could have been the first and the third, in which case your path would look like this is the first edge, this is the third edge. So in between those two things you will just fill in the intervals with the loops, that is what you do. If it was third and fourth, you will just take, stay here until you reach the third one. So the first and second you stay there, third, fourth. What is that number? Okay. Yeah, but you tell me the final number in, in a in a in a closed form. No. So four will get mapped to. Six is this correct? No. So for a, any path of length n, so I was telling this, so we need to go from here to here. For that necessarily we need to traverse this edge and this edge. This edge I can take only once, right? So if I have a length and path, I can take those those two edges at any point, just pick where I am going to take those. So each of those choice will give me a different path. So the number of paths will be n choose 2. So I do not know how you write this, it's like this or is it like this. Okay. So this will give me n choose 2 and this number is actually n into n minus 1 divided by 2, 1 into 2. Okay. Why I wrote this? Because previously we were all with n. So now if you look at it, the leading term, it has some n square somewhere. My objective is to realize this n goes to n square function. So somehow I need to go to the n square space. So just by adding n a few number of times, I won't reach n square. So this particular automaton here with all weights 1, this will give me n choose 2. which is actually n, this is actually half into n square minus n. So now can you tell me how to get n square, n square is our objective. So I don't like that half, I want n square, so there is a half there. To remove that half, what can I do? Okay, I will put two such things, okay. So it will be n choose 2 plus n choose 2, okay, so the half is gone. So what I have now is n square minus n. So this will give me n square minus n. I don't want the minus n. What can I do? So we just add the graph for n also here. Okay. So to get the n square term, I had this paths of length 2 which gave me n choose 2 and from there I could get n square and I had to like multiply it by some suitable denominator right. 
to make that vanish. There were some smaller terms that you wanted to subtract, which means you just add those things up. So it, if, you, if I have to get n cube, I have to look at pass of length 3 because that will be like n choose 3. The same thing if I just have a k length chain with self loops everywhere, it will be giving me n choose k. And the leading term there will be n power k. Okay. So in fact, using some such tweak, you will, you will get any polynomial. By the way, this graph can be better represented like this. as a square because this is exactly what we want. This is a square, right? I mean, okay, my drawing is bad, but it's a square, supposed to be a square. Okay, this thing, so this is the final. This path is this thing. It has, ah, here is my loop. So it has loops everywhere. So this path, it's the one length path n choose 1 n okay and then there is the two length path and there are two of them so one is here and one is there so you can nicely fit that this particular thing by merging all the initial states into a single one all the final states into a single one and then you get a square so I will not do now for n cube but you can go back and Convince yourself that you can actually draw a cube and that will give you the cube. Okay, so how will that cube look like? This is the initial state. So everywhere I will put loops that I will put later. Everywhere I will draw the diagonals as well. There is a main diagonal which goes there. This is the final. So it starts from one corner of the cube. It ends in the other corner of the cube. And everywhere I will put the self loops also. This cube, <laughs> in fact, will compute n cube. Okay. So, So I cannot draw it now, but yes, you can do that also. So you just take paths. So here, if you look at it, there are well, paths of so there are paths of length three. The maximum length, I mean, length as in when I draw the automaton. So in, if I just forget the loops, there can be paths of length three. So there is something like this, for example. One second, I made a mistake. So I can go up there, then go to this node, and then there. This is a like traversing three different sites. That's the length three thing, and that will actually give me n choose three. Okay, so n choose three is n into n minus one into n minus two divided by. 1 into 2 into 3. So the denominator there is a 6 coming. So in fact, to offset that I need 6 such paths. And you can verify that there are 6 such paths, 3 lengths paths in this cube from one of the corner to the other corner. Okay. So all those things, that 6 multiplication factor will come there. You will get n cube. Then there will be some n square terms that you need to subtract or add. So those things you will see from here. So this, once you pass a, take a diagonal along a face, then there is only one other edge that you can take. So there will be, I think, again, six many such length two um, or automaton which look like them. Okay. So this, by the way, this is a valid automaton, valid graph which does this. This is the same thing in a different uh, form. Okay. Similarly, here I drew it as a um, as a what is it called? As a cube. But you can also like draw it like lines. So if you want n power 4, what you would do is you will do, um, okay, so this length should be 4. So I have to pick 4 such edges because then only then I get n, n choose 4. I will put loops everywhere, make this final, make this initial. So for n choose 4, the denominator will be 4 factorial. I will make 4 factorial such copies. 
okay and then look at what is the next term so you will have an offset so you need to add those so and maybe there also you have to uh, multiply it sufficiently for the denominator change so in fact I, instead of taking the copies i can also multiply here with four factorial i can put four factorial as my initial weight that will also do the job for me so any of this would work so any n power k you can realize using such something like this so so i'm not realizing polynomials so i'm realizing functions which are like n is getting mapped to n power k okay it's, it's a general series where the coefficient of the ith term x power i would be i i power whatever okay i power 7 for example this kind of things i can represent using such a graph so polynomials i can represent fibonacci series i could represent constants i could represent there are many other things that i can represent i cannot represent also so it turns out that some interesting theorems which would say that the things that I can represent are that you know you can write inductive definitions using a so maybe using a G and some other things so if you can give inductive definitions using a finite number of such functions essentially you can realize uh, you can recognize it otherwise you cannot this is a kind of characterization uh, which we will not do but it's just to give you a flavor of it so it's already 12.33, should I go on or? Okay. So I will, so in maths, I think when you have series and such stuff, your objective is to see whether the series converges to some value or something like that. In computer science, um, these are essentially representation of functions and we want to ask questions about them. Like, given two such graphs for example i want to know whether they represent the same function okay this is or essentially i have this kind of question and then we have to come up with algorithms for those okay so yes it's all algorithms so the question is this question is the equivalence problem so given two such graphs which represent potentially two different series okay do they represent the same series or do they represent the same function Called them F1, F2. Both of them are given by two different such graphs. So this problem, well, I will try to give an idea of how to solve this problem. This problem, in fact, you can have an algorithm to check whether they are actually the same. So this problem is equal to asking whether look at this function F1 minus F2, okay, in which n will get mapped to F1 of n minus F2 of n. Okay, there's a map function from integers to natural numbers to integers. So function can take a negative value. Okay, so this is f1 minus f2. Maybe I can call it g. Okay, so g of n is f1 of n minus f2 of n. So f1 and f2 are identical, they are equivalent, they are equal if g of n is 0 for every n. Okay, it's uniformly zero. It's a constant function zero. So given a function, if I can check whether that is zero, then in fact I can check whether two functions are equal. Oh, by the way, for that I need to write, say that if given f1 and f2, I can actually get a get a graph for f1 minus f2. Okay, so given f, a graph for f1 and a graph for f2, can I get a graph for f1 minus f2? So how can I get f1 plus f2? We just put them next to each other. Right? Huh? Just draw separately without connecting. Without connecting them. Just draw separately. So the number of parts or weight that you had here plus weight that you had there, that is what you will get. Okay. So this was f1 plus f2. To get f1 minus f2, what you do is you will do exactly the same thing. In just in f2, just change the initial weight to minus 1. Or if it was plus 3 before, make it minus 3. Just mul multiply the initial weight with a minus 1. Okay, so the weight that you compute there is just going to be negative of the previous weight and it's just the addition. So that making that minus 1 will make compute minus f1 and then it is adding f1 plus minus of this. Okay. 
So you can if you have this graphs for F1 and F2 you can easily get the graph for F1 minus F2. The number of nodes of this graph is just the sum right I mean it's just disjoint copies is that here you added a negative weight integral. Okay, so now is g equal to 0 constant function. This is the question that we are asking. So if we can, if we can answer this, we can answer that. So we will just say that we can answer this one. This is what we will do. And to do that, okay, even though our weights are all going to be integers, we say that, okay, why trust us? Maybe we are going to see them all inside the real field. And given a graph, These two are final and these two are initial, okay? And I'll put some weights to one. So if I do not write the weight somewhere, it means it is one. The unit, the identity. graph this particular graph has four vertices four vertices okay so I will try to understand when I am when I am traversing paths of some length I can think of it as every state so there are paths which could so after so I'm, I, my intention is to read, let's say, path of length 23. So far I have read, read just up to length 6. Okay, I have traversed 6 edges. After reading 6 edges, I could have been in state 1 or in state 2 or in state 3 or in state 4. So I just try to see if I was, after reading 6, if I ended up in state 2, for example. There were several paths that could have ended up in state 2. Okay. And so far the partial product of those weights, it was some numbers, the sum of them is some number. This is the accumulated weight in state 2 and then I will, when I take the next transition, I will again multiply it with the next uh, next edge of the weights and I will move into some other thing. This is what I will do. So at every point, we can think of it as there is a weight distribution in each of the nodes of the graph. Okay. So initially when I start, before even taking any edge, I can potentially be in this state with weight 1, I can be in this state with weight minus 1, okay, because that is how I said it. I could be in this state with weight 0, essentially I cannot be there, or in this state with weight 0, this is how I understand it. So initially there is a weight distribution and that weight distribution, I am going to write it as a vector. Vector in r power 4 here, 4 because there are 4 vertices. So the number of vertices is a finite, so I will look at that dimension. I am going to R uh, because I want it to be a field. Okay. But anyway, I am writing integers and they are anyway contained in R. So that's not a problem. So initially I start from this. And in general at some point I could be in another vector. Okay. So if I am in some, some vector, let us say I have some weight W1, W2. W3, W4. Okay, after reading some length, I am taking one more edge. What will be the resulting weight distribution of this graph in this graph? So, what is the resulting? weight that is going to come to 1 after taking one more edge. Hmm? W1, 
W1 is not going to. So whatever weight you had accumulated here in 3, that will get multiplied by 1 and that will come here. Okay, so the, because there is only 1 incoming at, which is from 3. What is the weight that is going to go in 2? Whatever weight you had accumulated here previously, which is W1, W1 times 2 will come there, plus <coughs> W2 times minus 1, because you could have taken this, plus, ah, that's it, that's the weight that you would end up with having in W, in 2. In 3, it would be W2 times 1. And in 4, it would be W3 times 2 plus W4 times 1. Okay? So, essentially, it is a transformation. You have a vector. You are going to transform that into something else. And how exactly do you transform? It is exactly given by this graph. And you can just represent them as a matrix. Okay? And what is that matrix? So, just think of it as 1, 2, 3, 4. How these weights get transformed? Okay, so it's like whatever weight you have accumulated in 1, you will multiply it with a 2 and put it in 2 and you are not putting the weight anywhere else. Okay, so 1 will have 0 impact in 1, at 2 you will go there with a weight 2, 3 with weight 0, 4 with weight 0. On 2, from 2, you will not have any impact into this thing. Into 2 you can go with minus 1, into 3 you can go with 1, with 4 you can go with 0. So like that you can just fill it up, okay. You will just get a matrix, I am not filling it up due to lack of time. I get a matrix. I know that I start from this thing, this is a matrix. So the next vector I will get after reading the path for length 1 is actually this vector times this matrix. Okay, that will give me the next vector. Okay, then I will get, after 2 steps what is the vector I will get? The previous resulting vector times this matrix. So every time I will just multiply this way with this matrix and I will get another weight distribution in the state space. And all these weight distributions, they are all in R4, okay. So these vectors, these vectors that I will get there, we call them like reachable vectors, uh, reach, reachable distributions. Just look at the space generated by these reachable vectors, okay. It is a subspace of R4, okay. I will just try to get a, what is it called? Um, uh, basis for this subspace and this basis I can get from this reachable vector. So maybe I will take this as my first element in the basis. I will get what happens in the second thing. I see whether that is already linearly independent from whatever I have gotten from before. If not, I will add this also into the basis. If it is already linearly independent, I know that. So already whatever things I have got them, got there, when I multiply it with the matrix, I am already getting something which is linearly, uh, linearly dependent on them. So I can just stop my procedure. This is my algorithm. You start from this initial vector, compute this matrix, just keep getting the next, next vectors until you cannot get any more linearly independent vector. How many times will you need to iterate it? Huh? At most 4 times because it is R4. So the dimension is 4. You will not get more than 4 vectors. Okay? At most 4 times. Maybe at 3 itself you will stop. So if you stopped at 3, it means that you know you had actually a smaller representation with a fewer number of vertices for the same function. So this iteration will stop. You will not take more than the number of nodes of the graph. And, uh, and now you have identified this basis vectors. And for each of those basis vectors, you check whether when you multiply them with this final weights and add. So okay, how do you multiply with the final weight? It is as good as writing 0, 1, 0, 1. So this is a column vector okay, with the output weights. So this is not an output state, so weight 0. This is an output state with weight 1. This is, an, this is a final state. Final state with state 0, weight 0. This is a final state with weight 1. That is the vector that I drew here. It is a column vector. So, I, so at any point I have a weight distribution. If I was stopping there, I will just multiply with the column vector. I will get a scalar. I will get a number. If that number is 0, which means means that the weight is 0. So for every of those bases, if it was going to give me 0, no matter what linear combination I write, I will get a weight 0 when you multiply. Okay. And so if I have, so in this particular example, I will have at most 4 bases. Each of them I will check whether when I multiply with this column vector if I get 0, then I know that no matter which vector I am going to get, if I multiply I am going to get 0 only because whatever vector I get I can express it as a linear combination of these base vectors. 
they are all going to give me zero. Okay, so that is an algorithm for checking whether it's actually giving me the value zero or not. The function is uniformly equal to zero or a constant zero for every n. And if of course for some basis, if it was not a zero, already that is my reachable vector, right? And for on that particular value, I, I know that it is not going to be a zero value, value is not going to be zero. So I can check whether it is zero and using that, I can also check what we just said here, whether these two things are equivalent. So I'll stop here. Um, yeah. So by the way, these things are actually generalized for, so we only saw univariate polynomials or series here, for also for multivariate, okay. So you can have terms like, you know, x, y, x square, y, whatever, series of that things also. For those things also, this, this kind of faded automata are there and it need not be always over this, uh, this, this reals or integers or whatever, it can be over any semi <coughs> And turns out that if we are in the real case, this plus and multiplication, this equivalence problem is desirable, like we have an algorithm for that. In general, it may not be the case. So there are situations where we cannot check whether given two graphs, whether they are equal. In fact, we can mathematically prove that there is no algorithm. It's not because we are not smart. We can actually prove that nobody can ever come up with an algorithm. We can even prove some things like that. So we are asking this kind of computability. Can you compute? How efficiently can you compute? or prove that it is not computable. These are the kind of things that we try to answer in a theoretical computer sense. And these are kind of mathematical models that we use, which will abstract computations or programs sometimes. So the equivalence of two graphs is not computable? So in, in this case, if, if it is just natural numbers or uh, reals and product and sum, then it is computable. So we can check it. So this is the algorithm, this basis computation. But if you are in a different semiring, for example, max plus, okay. So which does not, so if it is, if, if this semiring can be embedded inside a field, we can do it because we can do this basis computation, linear independence, all those things. In other things, this linear independence and uh, basis, it's, it does not give a space, vec uh, vector space. So then this will not go through. And in many such cases, it's impossible to get an algorithm and there is proof for that.